Okay, uh, good evening for the second week of Nuts and Bolts. Um, Hopefully all of you who's taking it for credit have emailed their teams into the TA. If not, just, that's just a reminder. Um, so second week, let's, let's do a retrospective. Uh, the first night, I came in and gave you an overview of uh, new ventures. And we talked about two things that we were going to follow through on the, on the uh, theme. That is create value and then capture some of that value so you can do it again. And the second part of that first night, Bob Jones, who's here again tonight, uh, talked about finding your customer. Talked about who do you create value for and how much value in that whole process. He talked about how your customer may change over time. He talked about um, finding your customer's influencer. A bunch of really practical things on that. The second night, I came and talked about business models, which is about capturing that value, some value. We talked about different types of business models, uh, everything from technology-based to financial, with a bunch of different examples, and hopefully different ways of you to think about it, of how you're going to actually deliver and capture some of that value so you can do it again. And then Yost came and talked about um, organizational and people issues, the things that are always the hardest issues. Um, and he gave you some examples of real live things that came out of MIT. And then we had the founder's journey with Ken Zolot, where he brought back people who were just a little bit ahead of you in the process, uh, some of whom actually sat in your seats and uh, talked about some of their challenges and gave some practical advice. And then Charlie Tillett came in and talked about financial projections. How do you, how do you figure out what kind of resources you're going to need and how, that, how does that cost you know, out and how do you build those things? Um, and so that was our first week. And I'm going to skip tonight just for a moment and, and talk about tomorrow so you get the bigger picture. Tomorrow we have a financing sources panel, different financing sources, what do they look for, advice from them about uh, how to go about uh, funding your business. And I'll do something on legal issues, all those pitfalls hopefully you'll avoid. And then the last night it will be Yonel Cherry coming back and telling us the story that you don't get to hear mainly about a, a real life story of a company and all of its ups and downs. It's a fascinating story, so don't miss that. And tonight, we have Bob Jones back, because you can do all of that work, and if you can't figure out how to convey it to people, you're going to have a problem. So Bob's going to talk about uh, presenting your venture. And the second part of the evening, we have uh, uh, Mindy and Vicky talking about negotiation and um, uh, conflict. And I'm glad they can make it tonight, because I was going to send them to Washington uh, if the shutdown was still going on because they could use that, those skills down in Washington. So at least for two weeks or three weeks or whatever, they're going to be here teaching you those things. So without further ado, you know Bob Jones. Take the floor, Bob. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. And I'm glad to see you uh, survivors that are still here. I, I knew last Tuesday that there would be fewer of you here tonight than there was last week. So. Uh, that's probably a good thing because this life isn't for everybody and the sooner we can help you figure out that it's not for you, the greater favor we will have done you. Uh, for the remainder of you folks here, uh, may I suggest counseling and medication? Um, I want to take a minute and tell you a little bit about what to expect tonight. I'm going to talk for a little while, and then you guys are going to talk for most of the rest of the session. I'm going to invite you to give several different kinds of pitches. I know you're expecting to talk about how do you pitch to a venture capitalist, and there will be a little bit of that, but I've deliberately de-emphasized it for a couple of reasons. One is that tomorrow night you're going to learn that there are a lot of other places you can go for money besides venture capital. And so I don't want that to be the only way you think of collecting funding. And also because I do believe that your skills in pitching and presenting your venture will be helpful in everything you do. But we've been doing this for a while, a few years now, and we've observed in the past year or two 
that innovation and entrepreneurship have become fashionable. And startups have been thought to be glamorous. And there are lots of people who think, oh, I'll do that. It'll give me something really cool to talk about when I get together with my friends. And there's been a bunch of myths that have popped up. There are lots of startups and lots of money. If I bring my amazing idea to investors, they will shower me with money. So which part of this is false? Pardon me? Which part? The second one. Yeah, that's correct. Now, there have also been a number of organizations pop up that purport to teach you how to do this, whether they call themselves accelerators, incubators, boot camps, or whatever. They've, they attract paying customers, and they have promulgated certain myths with that as well, one of which is there's a magic formula for success. If you follow the path that we'll teach you, investors will shower you with money. Which part of that is false? How about both? <laughs> so as we developed this curriculum, that left us with a choice. Do we tell you the myths or do we tell you the facts? And since we're not taking your money, we may as well tell you the facts. Here are a couple of facts. It's hard. Most startups fail. Most investors believe, based on their history, that you will fail. I hate it when that happens. Here's a few more facts. There are a lot of entrepreneurs. That means that you have lots of competition for talent and for money and other resources. And since there are more entrepreneurs than there are resources, many won't get the talent and the funding that they want. That's kind of gloomy, isn't it? So what do people actually invest in? By invest, I mean customers building relationships with you, people who accept your offer of employment, as well as people who offer cash. Well, you start with an idea, and you hope to bring it, turn it into a product. But a good idea isn't the same as a good product. I had a good idea. Let's make something that would help people sleep at night. And our first iteration tasted so bad it would have stopped a rhinoceros. It was not a good product. Once we fix that, the next question is, do you have a good business? Because a good product isn't the same as a good business. If you make it for $5 and sell it for 3 probably not a good business. People want to work with promising businesses. They like to see a great team, skilled at execution, and they understand their business. And since you never have enough information when you accept a job working for somebody, one of the things you look for is can the leader communicate all of this clearly and persuasively? If you walk away saying, I think she's a genius, but I really didn't understand what she was talking about. And if I didn't understand what she was talking about, her customers probably won't understand what she's talking about. Her investors probably won't understand what she's talking about. And I think the odds are pretty good this business will tank. Hence, tonight's program. So our agenda, we'll talk a little bit about what's a pitch. What do you hope it'll do for you? And then you'll give some pitches. We'll try to distill out some guidelines. We'll give some more pitches. Wrap it up with some questions and send you out to the next session. So I'm going to ask you in a while to consider coming forward and giving a pitch for a hiring situation. So you want a key executive. You know she's used to making a lot more money than you can afford. But you really think she'd add a lot to the business. But that's not what she cares about. What she cares about is what can you do for her. So that hiring conversation might be a little different from what you're used to, but it's crucial. So be thinking about that. I'll also want to suggest as a framework <clears throat> excuse me, that you have run across a prospective big customer whose order will make your year. Right? Your revenues thus far have been modest. If this one comes in, oh my god, we're in Walmart. How do we close that deal? 
And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about raising capital. Okay, so hold those three ideas in mind while we talk through a little of what's coming up. Okay, so far? Okay, so Grasshopper, what is this pitch you speak of? Well, it's some sort of presentation that's intended to persuade others of your point of view and to bring about some kind of desired behavior. Yes, I will work for you for almost nothing. Yes, I will place this big order. So, let's talk a little bit about to whom might you present, why are you doing it, and what do they want? You might remember that last week I said there were really two components to marketing. Find out what your customer wants and give it to them. It's important in this. What do they want? And what are your goals? What do you want? So potential audiences for your pitch include customers, potential employees, current employees. When would you need to pitch to your current employees? To Sorry? To motivate. to motivate. OK. What sort of circumstance might call for additional motivation? I beg your pardon? Lack of sales. Lack of sales. I uh, spent a little time in the St. Louis airport, one of my favorite places, <clears throat> last week, with a fellow who reported that his sales, his company's sales for the month of December were zero. So he had some worried employees. He had to motivate them. OK. Channel partners, retailers. How about if your parents want to know why you turned down that high paying gig with Amazon to go start a company and starve to death? That might be a presentation. And of course, one day you might need to talk to investors. There's two requirements for a pitch to be successful. Actually, there's lots of them, but there's two key ones. One is that your audience has to find your idea appealing. So a good fit. You might remember last week I talked a little bit about the diabetes business that we had. The first investor to write a check to us had an older sister who died from precisely the problem we built our business to correct. I didn't know that. But in my initial remarks, I said, here's the problem, here's the consequence of the problem, and here's what we have worked up to address the problem. And he said, really? So it was accidental, but it was a good fit. I walked out with a pretty fat check in pretty short order. Bad fit. Ooh, well, how about if you have a biotech company and it turns out that the investor you're talking to only invests in software? Why are you even there? The second requirement is that they believe you. So it's appealing, they believe you. They believe you're telling the truth, and they think you can do what you say you can do. That's pretty simple, but it's usually overlooked. So let's understand our audience a little bit. Here's a basic question for you. Which one do they care more about, you or themselves? Do we ever forget that? Mm, maybe. So, should your goal be to persuade them that you're really smart? Boy, do I see that mistake being made all the time by people who are really smart. And think about it, in a meritocracy like this esteemed institution, you get ahead by being really smart. Sidebar, I was actually at a cocktail party a couple years ago, and. A woman there who was, in fact, an MIT graduate said, you know, my professors used to really like it when I would argue with them in front of the whole class. My boss doesn't feel that way. <laughs> Should you be trying to persuade them that your technology is really awesome or that your vision is really compelling? So what's the answer? All of those things. The answer is yes. 
But there's a key caveat. Some years ago, <laughs> one of the investors in a startup I had was Procter & Gamble, the uh, $80 billion a year consumer packaged goods company. Uh, the comical aspect of this was you could get my company in my car at the time. But I spent some time working with them, and one of the key messages, benefits first, then reason to believe. All right, so this weight loss product will cause you to lose weight and you'll never be hungry. And there are people who say, stop right there, where do I buy it? For those who are a little fussier, you can start talking about high glycemic index carbohydrates versus glycemic load, blah, 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 right? But benefits first. So these other things that you're really smart and your technology is awesome and your vision is compelling, those could be a reason to believe. But if you say, I'd like to build a business selling typewriters, doesn't matter whether you're smart or your technology is awesome. People don't want a typewriter. So their first priority is, how will this help me? I remember when as I framed this conversation a few minutes ago, I said I'm going to ask you and invite you to give a couple of pitches. Prospective employee, prospective customer, prospective investor. These are key. Now, this is a personal quirk, but I'm inclined to believe that you should dress appropriate to the audience that you're presenting to. It's sort of a sign of professionalism and maybe respect. And I think if your audience is really casual, you can be pretty casual. If your audience is a little dressy, you should be dressy. It helps to be just a notch dressier than your audience. And I thought I would show you what it looks like if you work a day in Joe Hadzima's office. <laughs> so, OK, kidding. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. <laughs> yes, there's a story behind that. All right, invest the time to understand what they want. What do they want? Ask and listen carefully. And believe it or not, it actually helps if you care a little bit about their needs. All right, I'm looking for X. I'm looking for a place where I can go to buy CBD products without running into the long arm of the law. Or I'm looking for a way to lose weight without having to eat god-awful tasting foods. Or I'm looking for a product that will fly off my company's shelves without me having to do a lot of management issues. So a sequence that I find to be effective frequently is a little introduction. Ask them what they're looking for. Make sure you understand it. Tell them why what you have will be great for them, and then provide some support. So if I'm talking to athletes who are competitive, do you care about your performance? How often do you measure your performance? Are you doing things now to improve your performance? Have you heard train hard, eat right, sleep? Do you have lots of help on how to train hard and lots of help on how to eat right? How much help do you have on how to sleep? I may have something that can help you. See where I'm going? Ask them for feedback. Wow, that sounds great. Terrific, I'll take your purchase order. A couple more guidelines. What helps you to be believable? Remember I said two requirements. They have to find your vision attractive and they have to believe you can do it. So what helps you to be believable? Suggestions? Ah, an MIT degree. <laughs> well, reference our earlier remarks about really smart. <laughs> In some circumstances, yes, that can carry a great deal of weight. If you happen to have one. <laughs> what else? I'm sorry? A track record. 
Ooh. You can say, well, let me tell you about the first two companies I took public. <laughs> You're probably in pretty good shape. All right. What else? Not, Not being overly cryptic. Elaborate on that, please. Scripted. You're able to flow with the conversation. You're not just rattling off uh, something that you memorized. You can go with the conversation. You're not just given a canned, pre-rehearsed, don't interrupt me, I'm on a roll speech. Yeah, I think all of that's true. I think conviction and enthusiasm and passion go a long way. But there is a line. <laughs> You shouldn't cross it. Lunacy is not appealing. It's a little off-putting. <laughs> but if you care about what you're doing enough that you might have to work a Saturday or even a Sunday now and then, people like that. Supporting evidence, your track record, to use your phrase. Brevity. I run into an awful lot of people who can do a fabulous job of talking about their business if they have 30 minutes. And they make a complete train wreck out of it if they've got three minutes. So brevity is key because people have a limited attention span, other than you, of course. Three rules of how to be bre of, of brevity. Be clear. Be brief and stop talking. This requires ruthless editing. So how much information is right? Boy, I've been in a lot of situations where it's a pitch contest. You get 10 minutes. At the end of the 10 minutes, they shut your mic off. Harsh. And an awful lot of people think, I've got 12 minutes worth of stuff. And what I'm going to do is talk really fast and tell them every single technical detail I can think of because that's the only way I can get 12 minutes worth of stuff into 10 minutes and they'll love it. Is that true? No. It's not true. You look like somebody who didn't trim it. So ask yourself, what do you want them to remember? Turn your computer off and ask yourself, if somebody asks them, what did you say in your pitch, how do you want them to answer? All right, let me say that again. Turn your computer off and ask yourself, when I walk out of here tonight, what do I want you to remember? Last week, I wanted you to remember that triangle, right, market segmentation, maybe one or two other things. I don't think people can remember more than about three things. So probably the three that they will remember are the three that are most relevant to them personally. So if you're talking to a pr prospective employee, rattling on forever about your technology, probably not going to stick. OK so far? Oh. Rick, I'm going to shut this mic off for a minute and just talk on the other one. Thank you. can't tell you how many talks I've been in where the person with the mic's got it out here somewhere. And it's finally made me so neurotic that I think I have to talk about this a little bit. Because I've seen many a good pitch just go right in the dumpster because people never got told how to use a microphone. So some mics are what you call omnidirectional. They will pick up sound from all around. And so if you're presenting at the Academy Awards, you will probably be handed or be in front of an omnidirectional mic. You can see that there are different heights, different distances from the microphone, and it's not sensitive. But most of the time, mics like this are for people who are standing in front of a band or some other situation, and you don't want the drums and the horn section coming through your mic. You want the vocals to come through your mic. These mics are more unidirectional. So they amplify what you point at them, and they ignore background sounds. 
So you'd be more like this. So speak down the barrel of the mic, not over the top. Hear the difference? If you speak over the top of the mic, most of what you have to say is lost. And if you've got the mic out here, okay, it's, it's one of those details that seems so pedestrian that it doesn't even have a place in an MIT conversation. But I've seen a lot of good pitches get butchered. Oh, and by the way, you don't have to do like Jay-Z and hold the mic like this. <laughs> That's just styling. It might look cool. It's not really the optimal way of getting fidelity out of the mic. <laughs> and and the, the folks in the <laughs> in the back room are saying, "Yeah, <laughs> thanks, guys." Okay, I'm live on the lavalier again. Thank you, Phyllis. Okay, one last. In conversation, a lot of us often talk pretty rapidly because we're face to face with our friends, and it's sort of comfortable, and that's okay. But in a presentation, it's a different style of speaking. Slow down, enunciate clearly, and give your audience a chance to process those pearls of wisdom you've got coming out. This is hard to keep track of if you're nervous. All right, slow down, speak clearly, and if you're holding one of these bad boys, speak down the barrel of the microphone, okay? All right, your turn. So here's the scenario. You are building a team for your business, and you believe that adding the right executive will help your company grow. So guideline for you as a presenter, set the stage, of course. Tell us a little bit about what's your business and what position are you trying to fill. Are you looking for a co-founder, a chief operating officer, a chief marketing officer? Do you just need an accountant? Do you need an office manager? What's the spot you're trying to fill? And I'm actually going to invite two people to come up, one to give the pitch and one to be the recipient. Because when we get done, the first person I'm going to ask for feedback will be the person who was pitched. Then we'll open it up to get feedback from the rest of you guys. OK? And guidelines for you and the audience. Pay attention. You don't owe the presenter love, just respect. But offer some guidance that will help them improve their presentation. And when your turn comes, incorporate it into your presentation. OK? Who's game? All right. Are you going to be a, a hiring person? Um, yeah. I have Sorry? I have well, that's irrelevant. Come on down. We'll pretend you're going to hire somebody. All right. All right. And we need somebody who is going to be the recipient of this fevered sales pitch. Oh, come on. All you have to do is stand there. Good. Come on down. And we met last week. I can't remember your name. Michael. Michael. Victoria. Victoria, you presumably know Michael, since you're trying to hire him. So Absolutely. We go way back. Nice to meet you, Michael. <laughs> so uh, before we start on all of this, set the stage for us. Tell us what your business is and what kind of position you're seeking to fill. All right. Um, well, I have a widget making business. Um, but we make widgets much better than the competition, because we use AI to make our widgets. Um, <laughs> So our business has been around for six months. So far, we have eight interested customers, um, and we have three VCs who are interested. OK, hang on. Let me interrupt you. You're, in, you're about to go into an interview to fill a particular mm -hmm. position, and this lad is a candidate to fill that position. What's the position? We want to hire you as our CTO. Chief Technology Officer. To 
improve the AI for our widget making machines. Okay, and we all know that Mike actually was the chief technology officer for three companies prior to this and was making about 50% more cash than Victoria has in her budget. Okay, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so are you set? You ready to, to, be, to begin the, the pitch? Oh, I already started. All right, take yes. it away. Just to specify, I'm still working on previous projects mm -hmm. or not. Oh, yes. He, he asked, is he still working on a previous project? A man with these credentials is obviously employed. <laughs> right. So, yes, she's going to try to mm -hmm. lure you away yeah. from the job you have now to take one where you'll get to work a lot harder for less money. Mm -hmm. Tough. So, oh, and by the way, the company's probably going to fail and you'll probably be unemployed within six months. <laughs> Again, no pressure. <laughs> All right. Take it away. So Mike, um, I think that you should come work for my company because I know that you are making a lot more at your job currently, but not only will you get equity in this amazing widget business, um, but we have a passionate team. We have some very promising deals. Like I said, we have eight customers who are already interested. We have um, VCs who are looking to give us money, so we will be able to pay you soon. And um, this company has a high potential for growth. Besides that, we have a ping pong table. <laughs> Are you convinced? Um, uh, not really, because uh, you didn't ask mm -hmm. what, uh, what Bob Pinier is. So ask mm -hmm. me what I potentially want. So any seed that you can catch that motivates me, because... Speak into that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I will just repeat. So uh, I told that, uh, as Bob mentioned initially, um, that you need to find out what I what I am looking for. Maybe something convinced me. Maybe something on my present job is not really I like to. Mm -hmm. So because now you're pressing, you're um, seeing things that you know quite regular and every. Uh, you know, executive or founder of its own business who love its business, you know, will say such kind of things. With, but not about ping pong table, that's what cool. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I, I still don't have, you know, this kind of personal negotiation and uh, to make me interested in continuing conversation. Or it could be in other situation when somebody, for example, introduced me to yourself and said, she's cool, amazing, take care, and so on. So that's... Right, I'm going to repossess yeah. the microphone here. <laughs> yeah, <please. laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. All right, let's open it up to some feedback from you guys. Thank you, by the way. Yes. Stop right there for a second. We're recording this, and your comments are unusually good. So, so I'm going to ask you to repeat them. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> uh, I think she could have uh, framed the, the pitch from his perspective in terms of what it can do for him. So, in t you know, it could be you'll be part of, the, part of a very tight, small team. We have a great team. You'll be part of the founding team and really have the opportunity to shape this great company. And you'll be, you know, we all believe in this product and you know, we believe it's, it's, it's the future. So be part of the future. Do you guys agree with that? Sir. People. I don't think you said that explicitly, but that's what you hinted at, that, that you would be part of the people who would be getting money from selling the company. You're not just someone working for me. You're someone who's leading the company, right? And that, I think, is something that's very attractive to someone who already has a job but wants to have a bigger impact. 
All right, let me summarize that for, for the re recording. Now, stand by for a second. I've got to repeat this. Um, first of all, we have to give her props for making it up on the spot. <laughs> but then second, point out that there are some benefits for this proposition which are different from his current proposition, right? And I would like to let a couple more people do this, but I think one of the things that she could have done in her two minutes is start by saying, so Mike, I know that you're a talented guy and I know that you're already employed and at market rates, and yet somehow you have agreed to this interview. So there must be something missing. Tell me a little bit about that. Find out what your customer wants, give it to them. And it might turn out that Mike says, you know, we do make widgets, and we make pretty good widgets, but we don't use any AI in our widgets, and I'm sort of feeling the lack of challenge. Oh, did that door just open wide, right? <laughs> well, Mike, you'll be pleased to know that we're looking for a chief technology officer who can incorporate artificial intelligence algorithms into our widgets, and this will be a chance for you to really make a difference. Make sense? All right, let's give them both a hand. Nice job. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you both. Going first is always tough. All right, let's do one more of those, and then let's talk about another situation. Come on down. All right, we've got the pitch. Who's going to be the, the pitcher? Who's going to be the catcher? Come on, that's the easy job. Thank you. Your name? Mike. Good to meet you. And, and wait, here comes your interviewee. And your name? Marcella. Marcella. All right. You're going to tell us what you're hiring for and what your company is and tell us, not her. She hasn't walked in yet. Okay. So, tell so us my company is uh, it's a platform to facilitate direct sales between the seller of real estate and the purchaser of real estate. Wait, uh, platform a bank. to accelerate what? To facilitate, facilitate. Uh, the direct sale from the seller, seller financing of real estate. Okay. And the position that is open that you hope to fill is? Oh, CTO, always. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how do you spell that? CTO. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I, I forget. <laughs> That's the only reason I went to MIT, I could spell it. <laughs> All right, so you're looking for a chief technology officer. Marcella has just walked in. Take it away. Hi, Marcella. Thank you for meeting with me today. Um, as you know, I'm, I'm involved in this startup, and we're creating this platform to try to cut the banks out of uh, real estate transactions. And, you know, I know you're this brilliant, brilliant software engineer, and you're working for this company at market rate, but yet you still took this meeting with me today, so I, I, I got to ask why. <laughs> Um, I'm looking for a challenge, and you know I've been uh, frustrated by purchasing a home in the past. So I want to see what we, I want to see what we can do to improve that. Man, oh man, boy, do we have a challenge for you! Uh, <laughs> well, that's great. You know, we, uh, we we think we've got a great product. We think we can really help a lot of people, and I know that's something that's really important to you. Uh, we'd love to bring you on board and, and help us uh, solve a very very clear problem and, and help a lot of people get in houses. What, uh, what, what, what can we give you? 50%. You got it. Sold. All right, Marcella, as promised, you get to go first. What, what feedback can you give him? Um, oh, gosh. I should have thought of this harder. Uh, I was pretty convinced, actually. I thought you were very excited about your company and um, that you seem to value my contributions and my uh, extreme technical skills, so I appreciated the compliment there, too. Um, I probably would want to hear more about, um, like, how you're different and how, um, like, my contributions personally, like, how, um, 
like what skill sets do you think I could bring um, that other people just you know compliment me on my brilliance and whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and audience, some yes, sir. At the beginning, he spoke very quickly, made him sound actually quite desperate for, for someone to join. It, uh, yeah, I don't think that's it. At the beginning, he spoke very quickly, and it made him sound almost desperate. Good. Carry on. Uh, so uh, I think the first point I'm going to cover is, is under, not just to understand what she wants, but what can you give. There's something overly concrete. So finding out interest and actually be concrete about what you can offer uh, and be different. That's what she's covered. I basically want to ask her why, why she's special versus like, let's say you had the pick of literary, you 10 or 15, you're entering 10 or 15 people to be CTO, not just one. But like why do you want her more than the other 10 or 15? Like well, let me offer a couple of additional contributions, as long as we're just piling on. <laughs> That's all right, I've, I've got this little goober here. Um, when he first started talking, most of us talk with our hands. You ever been stopped at an intersection, you see somebody sitting behind the wheel of a car? doing this stuff and you think, oh my God, they're having a seizure. But and they're actually talking on the phone and that's dangerous if you're holding a microphone because you started like this and ended up like this and like this and it was like, hello, 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 hello. <laughs> I mean, the Doppler effect was starting to kick in after a while. <laughs> um, that's a trivial point. Do we have any understanding of what he actually wants her to do? All right, remember the two requirements for a successful pitch. They find your vision to be appealing and they believe you can do it. And we're talking about a highly paid executive who would leave that position for something that's clearly risky. And you are in the 1% of entrepreneurs that I've ever encountered who spent too little time talking about your technology. I would love to, have, if I had been in your shoes, I would love to have heard a little bit about, Marcelo, there are a lot of people in the real estate sales game, and some of them, in fact, are in the direct sales business, but they have a common problem that we're in the process of solving, specifically these things. We're looking for a chief technology officer who'd like to really dig into the technical challenge of implementing these changes so that we can continue our differentiation and when we succeed, we will grab at least a 30% share of a huge market and the company's gonna prosper. I made all that up, it's probably completely fictitious, but you see where I'm going? So throw in enough substance that it sounds tangible and attractive. Yes? Okay, nice job, thanks. Okay, let's change the scenario a little bit. And let's talk about a prospective customer. This moves more into sales, okay? So, and by this, it could be an influencer. So, you have a new vacuum cleaner and you believe that the way to get the word out is by mommy bloggers. By the way, they hate that term. But some of them have 70,000 or more followers. And so you want to persuade the mommy blogger to talk about your vacuum cleaner to her. I, this is just an example, okay? It could be an influencer, it could be a client, or it could actually be the buying person for a big retailer, right? So that's who we're looking for. So once again, tell us who you are and, and who are we. Now you're going to pitch to the audience, not just to another individual. You're going to pitch to the audience. So who do you want us to be? Take two minutes. What are you selling? Why should we care? And address our potential concerns. So you'd like to make a million dollars a year selling a particular pill and You've priced them at a million dollars a piece, so you only need to sell one pill per year. My concern as a prospective retailer is it's gonna sit on the shelf for the other 364 days. That's lame. All right, so think about our concerns and address them. Guidelines for the audience, same as before. Pay attention, 
give some respectful feedback and incorporate it into the presentation that you will probably give before long tonight. Okay, who'd like to take a crack at this? Good, come on down. By the way, my compliments to all of you. It takes a lot of courage to stand up in front of a crowd, particularly a tough crowd like this one, and, and do this stuff. It's sort of like being seen in your underwear. So good for you for being so brave. Your name? Juan. Juan, good to meet you. And this is yours. So tell us a little bit about your business. Tell us what the situation is that you're selling into, and who are we? Hi, guys. My name is Juan Macaulay. I am from Chile. Uh, I am actually working now in a dairy company. We are developing a easy to digest cow's milk. It's 100% natural. And we are product, uh, pr producing the, the milk and we are looking for people that wants to be part of, of, the, of the company to work with us. So this is gonna be a sales presentation. Exactly, to, yeah, we to, need a sales team. So you're gonna be, who are we? Are we? Uh, a retail chain of, are we the people at Whole Foods that you want to carry this meal, or who are we? It could be Whole Foods. Whole Foods? Yes, that's a, that's a good option. You guys ever been in Whole Foods? Yes? <laughs> Whole paycheck, right? <laughs> okay, so you understand the, the environment, and, and you'll be able to assess whether or not his idea is a fit with what we've got. Okay, two minutes, go. Okay, let, let me start by asking a, a question. Who of you guys drank cow's milk when you were kids? Please raise your hand. Well, pretty much everyone. So it, it's a fact known that cow's milk is a very part important of the nutrition in kids here in the United States and back in Chile where I, I am from. But the issue is that the protein that you find in cow's milk is only 50% similar to the protein that you find in human milk. And that generates side effects. The side effects you all know, lactose intolerance, allergies, uh, tummy aches, and more. So my team, uh, uh, with a group of dairy farmers and uh, food entrepreneurs, we have developed 100% uh, natural cow's milk that is easy to uh, digest. And we, can, and we have managed to have a similar protein that is at least 80% similar to human's milk. So we are developing a new stage in, in, in milk that is more hypoallergenic. Now we are producing more than 25,000 liters a day and we need a sales team that is, is willing to help us to get uh, this product across and to uh, uh, develop and, and to get a better product for everyone. In, in the end, it was a little bit... <laughs> no, nice job. All right, let's offer him some feedback. What do you think? What about taste? I'm sorry? What about taste of it? Well, all right, so the question was, how does it taste, which I suppose you could have addressed in your, your talk, right? Yes. He focused on the health angle. All right. By the way, you, you, you may well know this, but the folks who do nutritional assessments assess proteins for their bioavailability. And number one, most bioavailable is human breast milk, and cow's milk is down that scale. And so if he's moved closer, that is a legitimate breakthrough. All right? Yes, ma'am. I really liked, like, I felt like you conveyed the idea for the product really well. Um, I didn't feel like you targeted it specifically to us as Whole Foods executives, so maybe you could have touched a little bit more on the alignment of that product with the Whole Foods portfolio and the Whole Foods, like, ethos of uh, healthy living. Okay, let me repeat that. She felt that he did a fine job of summarizing the product benefits and probably could have done a little better job talking about the excellent fit between what he's got and the Whole Foods food portfolio. Do we agree? Yes. Sir. And, and similarly, I would have liked to have an idea of the scope of the problem. How many people will have lactose intolerance? What are the potential customers that we're looking at that might actually come into Whole Foods to buy this, this product here? Okay, now we're closing in on money. Right, because really, that's what retailers care about. Yes. And so if you were able to buttress your pitch with this many million children every year, 
are not getting the nutrition they need, and there's, there are few human beings more desperate than parents of fussy children who are being malnourished. And if you bring our product into Whole Foods, you'll bring those parents into Whole Foods. By the way, while they're in Whole Foods, they're also going to buy your overpriced green beans and your overpriced all natural <laughs> chicken. And all that. But this will get them in the door. Right? I, is that where you were going? Yeah, I agree. That would have augmented his pitch a little bit. OK, Angela? Angela, stop right there. I can barely hear you, and I know the recording won't be able to hear you. So would you please? Pardon. OK, so I said um, I think it would be important for you to talk about your competitors and how your product is better and can better serve the Whole Foods customer. Do we agree? Yep. What did he do that you thought was really good? Yes, ma'am. He started with a question, engaged us all in what he was about to say, and he sort of established that it was an important part of everybody. He asked a question right up front and engaged the audience. So you knew right away that he was going to be talking a little bit about something that was healthy. Right? So if we incorporate your comment and this gentleman's comment up here together, he could, for example, say to the prospective Whole Foods buyer, how many of the customers that come into Whole Foods pay attention to their health? How many of them are willing to spend above market rates for products which are more healthy? I have something that's going to appeal to a group of underserved parents with children that they'll spend a fortune for and then proceed. Still, that's one of the better pitches I've heard at this stage of the game in a class like this. I think you did a great job. Let's give him a hand. Did you have a question, or are you volunteering to go? Oh, well, come on down. All right. Just to set the scene, I am going to sell Hoover vacuum cleaners to <laughs> bloggers. <laughs> Wait, vacuum cleaners to whom? The bloggers. To bloggers. Well, this I ought to be good. This. OK. Um, and, and, and forgive me. I'm going to be fussy and fastidious about this. Don't hold your mic out like this. All right, do it this way. How many of you have ever had a vacuum cleaner that sucks? That's a problem. Wait, they wait, all no. suck. It's just that some don't suck hard enough to clean your house. Average American households spend 20% of their time lugging a thing around, sucking up dirt that doesn't work. So we at Vacuum Cleaner Co. has come up with a robotic cleaner that not only saves time, but also saves your effort. So for, bloggers of, for, for all you bloggers out there, come sign up for one of these, and one of you lucky owners will be able to save money uh, by promoting us uh, the best that you can. <laughs> well, all right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's have some feedback. What can you offer this gentleman? Nothing. Oh, I see glassy eyes. Maybe you've sold a lot. Yes, ma'am. Let me elaborate on that a little bit. Let's hypothesize that you are, in fact, a mommy blogger, God forbid, and you have 60,000 followers, and they follow you regularly because they find you credible, which means you're not just going to slap an endorsement over any old pile of junk that walks in the door. And so her question is what makes your the specifics. Remember we said benefits first? I think you did a good job of that. Reason to believe, I didn't hear it. Is that where you were going? OK. So you don't have to answer that since I realize you were uh, improvising on the spot and doing your sort of stand-up thing anyway, uh, and, and doing a nice job of it. But the pitch would have been better if you had said, we have a revolutionary motor, which is 
packs a lot more horsepower into smaller space. It's lightweight, and it does a vastly more efficient job of blah, 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 whatever. Okay, so I'm sort of supporting data. Okay, what else? Okay, she's asking, what's in it for her? Will you ever be in a situation where the person on the other side of the table wants to know what's in it for them? Uh, how about every time, right? So, what's in it for her, she wants to know. Is it just a free vacuum cleaner? Well, if she's in the world of mommy bloggers, who's she competing with? About a gazillion other mommy bloggers. So, part of what's crucial to her is that she be able to bring breaking news to her audience. So, if you were to say, I have read about a dozen of your blogs, I think they're brilliant. Well, automatically she loves you, right? I think they're brilliant, and I know that you would like to be the first to break the news of an advanced technology that addresses an everyday need of your bloggers. Do you have a minute or two? In sales parlance, that's called permission to continue. And she says, well, you've got my attention. What do you got? Off you go, right? So, all right, nice job. You guys game to do one more, or should we move on? OK, we'll move on. What have we learned so far? Different audiences may require different pitches. We've seen some examples already. Why is that? Well, because their concerns are different, obviously. The buyer for Whole Foods got a whole different set of concerns than the mommy bloggers, right? The prospective chief technology officer probably has a whole different set of concerns from somebody who's interviewing for an accounting position. But in every case, what matters to your pitch is that your topic matters to them and that they believe you. That's where the supporting evidence comes in, that they believe you. Now, as a practicing musician, I can tell you there's an eight-letter word that we all hate. Sometimes you have to work really hard to make it look easy. I've done a bit of athletic competition. I've been a springboard diver in a number of situations for a long time. And the guys that got up there and made it look effortless, they were the ones that kicked my butt every time. But they had done the dive 10,000 times. These are new habits for many of us. You're retraining yourself. It's sort of a tradition here, technology first. Massachusetts Institute of, wait, right? Give your talk to an empty room. I ha have been in a number of situations, literally, where I had 10 minutes to pitch to the audience and they would shut the mic off. And though it sounds psychotic, I have gone in and reserved a conference room, put the timer on the table, and given the talk to the empty room. And it runs over every time, and I think, where am I going to cut it? How am I going to trim it? If you get really brave, record yourself. If your self-esteem is ever just a little too high, <laughs> you feel just too good about yourself, video it. Oh, <laughs> it's horrifying. <laughs> <laughs> but it's incredible as a teaching aid, right? So time it, practice it, record it, get good at it. It's a different way of thinking about it. Go back and listen to it the following day and say, oh, my God, I never asked them what they wanted. Oh, my God, I never told them how they could make money. Right? These things you often lose in the, in the heat of combat. And then... See the first bullet on the page. OK, let's talk a little bit about 
venture capitalists. There are people who think, maybe I can make a cold call. They get about 200 of those a week. They go nowhere other than into the trash can. So being resourceful, many of us say, well, maybe I can find somebody that's their friend and say, well, you know the guys at Highland Capital Partners. How about you make an introduction? Your friend's going to be thinking, is this a good fit? Does it even work? You're in the retail dairy business. They invest in pharmaceutical products, biomed. If it's not a good fit, then your request goes in the trash can. The next question, and they will never tell you this, are you going to make me look bad? I have a certain amount of social capital with this venture capitalist friend of mine. And if I send you in there and you look like the village idiot, I don't look good. Worse than that is if they start asking you challenging questions and suggest they might not invest, and you leap up on their desk and call them names, I'm definitely not going to look good. And many venture capitalists decline to give you a negative answer while you're there because they've had too much experience with crazy entrepreneurs who get really huffy and, you know, why the hell not? What's the matter with you? Nobody wants those conversations. So if they think you're going to make them look bad, into the dumpster. But if you pass those tests, you might get an introduction, and that happens about twice a week. Much better chances. So let's talk a little bit about an investor pitch, and then a few of you will get a chance to do that, you brave souls. They're going to ask you a few things like, well, what kind of capital are you looking for? Is this a convertible note, or are you talking about an equity investment? How much? What are you looking for? How far is it going to take you? Well, looking for three quarters of a million dollars, it's going to last us about 10 months. And of course, how's our firm going to make money from this investment? How much will we make? How long is it going to take? Some of the questions that are helpful to incorporate in your pitch, what's broke that you guys will fix? Translate it, what's the unmet need? How many have this problem? How are they addressing it now? Why is what you have better? We've heard a couple of people come up here tonight with something that's better. We've got widgets that use artificial intelligence. We've got cow's milk that comes much closer to duplicating the protein content of human milk. We've got vacuum cleaners that are more effective and efficient, et cetera, right? Who's going to be your first customer? How will you find them and let them know about your solution? How will you make money? So, guidelines, same deal. If you're presenting, set the stage. Tell us who you are. Tell us who we are. Are we commercial lenders? Who are we? You got two minutes. Tell us about your investment. Remember Joe talked last week about the elevator pitch being about 30 seconds? That's really hard. This is a, you got a little more leeway with what we're about to do tonight. So tell us a little bit about the investment. Why should we care? address our concerns, guidelines for those of us in the audience, like before, listen attentively, give them some useful feedback. OK? So I hope you can see why I held this to last. I wanted to walk you guys through some guidelines for some other stuff first. So let's pull it together. Who's feeling brave? Who's out looking for money? Come on down. Oh, you have a question, or are you volunteer? No, no, no. Because I know you can, like, right now, you want to do Come on down. All right, I think we should give her a hand automatically just for being brave. All right, tell us who you are, tell us who we are, set the stage for us before you actually start the pitch. Okay, okay. so give us a little background first. Uh, so I am currently an MBA student at Harvard uh, Business School. Okay. And uh, I am imagining that I am right now pitching to angel investors, even though I am still on the stage that I am building the team. 
Okay, just, angel investors. Yeah. Okay, not institutional investors. No, angel okay. investors. All right, no. everybody got that? Yeah. You ready? Okay. All right, take it away. Um, so today, one in three young Moroccans don't find a job. On the other side of the equation, one on three businesses don't find the appropriate skilled young talent. And this is mainly due to the fact that the Moroccan education system is based on rote memorization instead of active learning, which doesn't uh, provide children with the 21st century skills that we all know, collaboration, etc. So we want to tackle this challenge in a sustainable way and uh, the business model is uh, based on two uh, prongs. So on one front, we will provide STEAM project-based boot camps to uh, children from affluent family that will pay at a premium. Uh, right now in Morocco, there are a lot, uh, lots of very privileged families and the inequality is raising, so we are really tapped into these resources. Then those funds will cross-subsidize teachers' uh, trainings for teachers uh, serving um, uh, marginalized uh, population, children from marginalized population. So the idea is that this training will not only uh, enable those teachers to deliver the STEAM bootcamp, but also to have uh, other pedagogies that will enable them to foster the skills relevant uh, to their children. So everybody is benefiting from this model. The parents, who often during vacation and weekends don't know what to do with the children. Um, the teachers that actually in Morocco lack those kind of pedagogies. In Morocco, you have a, you, uh, you have a grade and then you have only six months to have a certificate for teachers, so you don't even have a teacher's grade. And finally, and most importantly, the children that have access and opportunity to develop 21st century skills that will uh, increase massively their chance to be employable. Okay, so, time's up. Thank you. Thank you. All right, what feedback do we have for her? She did a first-rate job of describing, I thought, of describing the problem and the unmet need. Talked a little bit about how she was going to address and meet the need, but she didn't say, if, if she did, I didn't hear it, anything about how she's going to get paid. So who's paying for these services, and how will what they get paid exceed what they will spend, and therefore profit, growth, et cetera? Do you guys agree, or did I just miss something? She said about parents. Yeah. Parents of which families to pay. That's yeah. the only thing of incoming of money she mentioned. Ah, my apologies, and I did miss, yeah. miss it. All because right. there are a lot of people that have a bunch of money and then can pay. She said a little bit about it, but still there is concern. If they have money, why do not send their children to some other country because there is already there is a good education. Uh, if they have the money, then why would they send their kids to you rather yeah, than Yeah, but when your children is like seven, eight, and between... They send their children when they are 18, but until 18, those children to those countries. And the boot camps are for like middle, primary, and high school, because it's when you need to build the skills. After it's way too late. No, uh, yeah, I'm just answering to your questions. <laughs> All right, so we think a, high marks for describing the problem and the implications of the problem and for the solution, maybe a little bit more emphasis on how the investor is going to get their money back. So you'll grow this business and one day it will be acquired by, or what, what's, you guys understand that owning a piece of a company does you no good until somebody else owns the company, right? They either buy it or it goes public, right? So that's called an exit. So how's my exit going to happen? is something that ought to get incorporated in your pitch the next time you give it. Okay. Fair enough? Well, right now it sounds quite virtuous, but not particularly profitable. 
Yes, sir. Last comment. Should, should, um, should she ask for like a number from them, uh, or like how much she would want uh, to get started? Should she ask or state how much she wants? It would be useful if she said, at this stage in our business, we are looking to raise $100,000 from four individual angels at $25,000 apiece. Because that does sort of bracket. If they say, oh, I never invest more than $5,000, end of conversation. If they say, I never invest less than 50, then they have the opportunity to say, would you consider a larger investment? No. Yes? We also, again, the same thing that we talked about with the customer, you always want to tell why or with the employees, like, why do you want that investor? Because each investor, like, cash is a commodity. Ah, uh, not all investors are created equal. There are some that are predatory, difficult, troublesome. You don't want them. Uh, well, <clears throat> for, that was an editorial comment. <laughs> so it would be useful to say also, I've researched the investments you've made in the past, and it looks like this is a good fit between us. But this is more than you can possibly incorporate into a two-minute talk. But yeah. It's an embarrassment of riches. Yeah. And just a question, because for this kind of venture, will it be more social impact investor, something like this? Well, that would be my first choice. Yeah. I mean, you're going to be here tomorrow night? Yeah. Okay. The woman leading the panel tomorrow night, our friend Julianne Zimmerman, knows a lot about social and impact investing. Okay, great. Buttonholer. Talk to her a little bit. Okay. okay perfect. Tell her it's my fault that you're annoying her. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All right. One more, and then we're going to call it a night. Hello. Uh, so uh, I'm going to represent here my company, who is an AI-based company, and you guys will be potential partners to my company. Does that work? Well, we're talking about pitching investors now. So that's, you may have missed your shot. We're looking for people, you're, the, the scenario is if you're holding this microphone, you're looking for money. Okay? Yeah. okay. Next time. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, in fairness to the audience, are you looking for capital? Come on down. Thank you. So my scenario is we are a cybersecurity and data safety company, and we're pitching to investors for a Series A. All right. Did everybody hear that? Okay. Good. Take it away. So thank you. I want to start off by telling you two stories that have to do with our company. The first has to do with corporations, large companies that sits on a wealth of information. This information is locked up, and as a result, 10 years ago, we had a great recession. Information was trapped inside these companies. They could not tell each other how much collateralized debt they had, but this sits even wider. These companies can't find out how much fraud they have. They can't find out what kind of customers they share. And this is a huge problem for companies today. Additionally, it's a big problem for you because private information today is being farmed by companies all around the world. This is like Facebook. This is like your telecom companies. And these are even hospitals. And these companies now are learning that they cannot share use any of this information to create new cures to provide better services to you. Now these might sound like very polar opposite problems, but they have a singular problem, data safety. Our company is currently trying to commercialize a new technology produced here at MIT to make any kind of personal or valuable information safe to analyze. This technology is called secure computation. It's been patented here at MIT through our work with a professor at CSAIL and now what we're doing is actually building out the front end of our technology. So we're looking for additional investment from you for our Series A to raise $4 million. With that money, we're going to build out our team, continue our customer development. We're actually working with companies in the credit card and insurance industry, as well as in the hospital industry. So we welcome you to talk with us. We're entertaining offers of half a million dollars and more. And so we would like you to be a strategic partner with us and to help us bring this technology to market. Thank you.
Not bad. Not bad. All right. Comments? Feedback? Yes, sir? Can I say, I think you did a fantastic job. The one thing that put me off very in the beginning was we have two stories to tell. I think that was like a red flag for some people. It's like, oh, God, he's going to tell me two stories. I think if you have sort of reworded it, it may have just eased me into this, to the story. And the story is engaging. It's just that one line was like, oh. So maybe if he finessed it a little bit and said, I'm going to tell you about a coin that has two sides. Something along those lines. But nevertheless, uh, I had a similar apprehension when he got rolling. I thought, oh, God, he's going to go way off the rails and talk about all this consumer privacy issues and how my Amazon Echo knows every piece of music I listen to. And, uh, but he didn't. All right, he talked about the problem. He tied it to companies, kind of tied it to economic opportunity. He gave a reason to believe several times technology developed here at MIT, patented by blah, 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 right? I mean, so there's some sub substantiation woven into the pitch, which I thought was quite good. I, I suspect you thought about that. Um, <laughs> maybe. What else? What other feedback can we? In the back, yes, sir. Speak loudly. So if I'm an investor and if I have to invest in the company, I would like to know a lot more about uh, the market perhaps competition, and the economics of the deal. Okay, he'd like to know more about the market, the competition, and the economics associated with all this. I think that's a fair comment. I think something that says somebody besides you thinks this is a problem. So if you can say companies are currently spending X on this and failing to achieve the results they want, and if we provide the results they want, we're going to get our fair share of that X something along those lines, would augment your pitch a little bit. Might require you trim the stories at the front end just a little to fit it all in. Yes? I want to swap the story to be one of your premium blue chip company customer stories, like what they did and what they sold. Because you said you were raising for Series A. At Series A, you've already got customers, I'm assuming, especially with your software. I want to know you're raising $4 million dollars I have 100 customers or 50 blue chip customers. I want to double, triple, quadruple that number. OK, another good point that, that uh, if he's raising a Series A, he's already had a seed round. And he probably has some customers, maybe some orders, some reorders, a little bit of revenue. You could buffer that out as well. Right. Did you want to comment? Just a quick one. You mentioned credit card companies and healthcare. And those are two vastly different markets. Oh, yeah. I'd be worried that you're going to take my first round. I don't know what you're going to do. That, that was the thing. you got to focus on one. So. Agreed. I keep hearing that. All right. But still, a first-rate job. Nice going. <laughs> All right. All right. A few words about pitch decks. And, th and, and that's not really the thrust of what we're talking about tonight. but. A lot of entrepreneurs overload their decks. Too long, too technical, and too much industry jargon. You can say AI for widgets in this room, and everybody knows what AI stands for. It's not always safe. All right? The best decks describe the problem and the opportunity in the first couple of slides. This URL down here has got a great example of this. There's a, an outfit. It's a little quirky and a little whimsical. But it's called Man Pack. You'll find their deck on there. They sell underwear to men. And in no time flat, you figure out men hate buying underwear. They hate going shopping for underwear. Press here, and the underwear come at your door. Everybody thinks, right? And you get it within, I mean, whether you agree with it or not, you understand their value proposition in very short order. So focus on the unmet need and how people are meeting it, show proof. This URL has about 30 examples, and this deck will be online tomorrow, next day. So uh, the one you're giving now, it's on now. It's on now. So you'll find this in the notes for all of this. OK. I'd like to turn you guys loose, to have, let you have a break, go into your next session. Do you have any final questions before I present you with a summary page? Yes. Um, 
So we're, we're working on an idea that's addressing a niche problem, but you know, the idea is that you know, you as you collect the data, you address a bigger problem. Um, I imagine that's sort of something you know, that you've seen a lot. I hate it when you do that. <laughs> I'm sorry. Say again. So it's basically how to how to connect a, you know, how to connect starting from a niche problem and then building it out to address a bigger problem. Um, so if you're if you're solving a specific problem, but with that data, with that experience, you can solve a bigger problem. You know, is that a, is that something worth? Including in the pitch, or should we just focus on the niche? Okay, the question briefly restated was if your current target is a modest sized niche problem, but you believe that in the course of solving it, you will be able to address a much larger problem, should you include that in your pitch? I would argue yes, but I would make sure that people understand that you're one step at a time, you're focused on steps A, B, and C. If you successfully address those, the upside is huge, right? Because entrepreneurs are well known to have attention deficit disorder and easily get distracted by lovely big opportunities and fail to execute. So I would say we're focused on this, but we're not unaware of the potential for a really big opportunity going forward. Yes, sir. We've had the question a couple of times when you're approaching investors, what's in it for, for the investor? Other than making more money, what is there to offer an investor? Do they care about prestige like the companies do? Like, do they do vanity projects? So if we elaborate on the what's in it for me question, are all investors the same? And do they only care about money? Uh, most of them don't care about you or your dog or your family or your children or anything, they care about their money. But some will have a personal stake in what you're doing and would love to see you succeed. For example, the one I gave about the fellow whose older sister died from the problem I was solving. There are some times when you'll establish a personal connection and they say, I love music. I would love to see this venture we talked about a week ago succeed. So I'm even willing to undertake a little more risk than I normally would just because I have a personal stake here. Calls for a little bit of research. If you can unravel that going in the door, your odds go up. But even if they love the idea, they still want to make money. Okay, summary. You guys have heard that joke, right? What are the two words that audiences most want to hear a speaker say? In conclusion. All right, you will need to make many pre presentations to a lot of different audiences. They're not one size fits all. Figure out how to harmonize your talk and your audience. So who are they? What do they care about? And if they do what you want them to do, why will they be better off? You don't have to tell them why you will be better off. Two of the most important components are they want what you're presenting and they believe you. And with luck, you will capture lightning in a bottle. Good luck and thank you.